Hello everyone, Joshua Gilliland here, one of the founding attorneys of The Legal Geeks. With me is Steve Chu for our ongoing discussion about Star Trek Picard. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about absolute candor and there will be absolute candor. Steve, how you doing? Doing great, how's everyone doing? Hey, Trek fans. It's uh, So it is President's Day, but we won't go into a giant discussion about Lincoln, Washington and uh, all of those issues, but they're, they, they're, you know, we do touch on themes that different presidents did champion. So let's get into uh, this episode. First up, did you like it? I did. I, I have enjoyed every episode thus far, and we are now at episode four, which has been billed to us as sort of the first episode post-pilot. Many sources and outlets uh, quoted the creative team behind the show as saying that the first three episodes are really like an extended pilot. Uh, and the fourth is the first one where, you know, the, the first three focus on getting Picard to his ship with his crew and off planet and ends with him saying, engage. Uh, so episode four is the first one where the adventure in that sense begins. Uh, I enjoyed it. I also have enjoyed the fact that all, you know, while this, because the series is set so long after, um, well, Nemesis, you know, roughly 14 years or whatnot after Nemesis, we get these flashbacks at the beginning of each episode thus far, it, you know, filling in more and more of the gaps. And there are a lot of gaps to, uh, to fill in. So, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities for storytelling. Uh, and I will also mention that I, I have started the um, book. I've been listening to the audio book um, for the prequel to the Picard show. And that's been a lot of fun as well. But how about you, Josh? Did you like it? Uh, I did because I'm just grateful to have Star Trek on weekly and it, it's just such a treat. You know, the, the beginning flashback with Picard visiting, uh, was it Vishtal is the Romulan Vishti, I think. Yeah. Vishti, uh, V-A-S-H-T-I. And a very Romulan sounding name right. uh, where you know he visits this kid and, and Picard's going full grandpa and yeah. it's, it's bloody adorable and yeah. for for you know it, it turns on the character on its head from the days of he doesn't like children to reading the three musketeers to a refugee child it's like yes. rock on right. so but but uh, you know we're 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 not here just to espouse how much we love Patrick Stewart and just seeing him read to a kid because it is adorable. <laughs> uh, um, Although that that is that, that's enough to make me watch the show. But yes, <laughs> he could have just kept reading a chapter. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been and, fine. Yeah. <laughs> worked for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we we go back to this planet. And because he needs help, so he he needs to to recruit someone uh, to assist with his you know crazy mission. So he goes back to the sisters that are the Romulan warrior nuns who are so unlike Romulans and Vulcans with you know saying what's on their mind is which is where the doctrine of absolute candor comes from. Uh, since Romulans are normally very tight-lipped and Vulcans aren't emotional, it's like well this is new <laughs> so uh, but when we when he beams down there's a sign that says romulans only on this bar and and the rule with uh you know tipping houses and taverns uh, that you know carries all of its way up to restaurants and everything in between is you can't do that you you i mean that, that's like saying whites only and this is literally born out of the civil rights movement that you know became law because of the Kennedy assassination. That's pretty much how it sailed through Congress. Was LBJ being able to to get it through because of you know, Kennedy died? Uh, even though I do think Kennedy probably could have pulled it off. I mean, he had been talking to Eisenhower for help for help from Northern Republicans to to help get it through. So I do think it would have eventually passed on its own. But LBJ was able to get it through. But we have laws specifically barring this sort of behavior. And we come back to it at the end where Picard throws down the sign and like and walks in to sit down. And I mean, it's very reminiscent of, uh, you know, uh, you know, freedom writers 
and sit-ins, except it's an old white man doing it, which again, turns so many things on its head. It's not funny. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's like, okay, like Star Trek, willing to own complex issues. And uh, sure, he had you know six minutes to beaming out. So on one level, good timing. So he has an escape <laughs> plan <laughs> in case things go bad. But um, what were... Um, uh, what were your thoughts about that, putting on your lawyer civil rights hat? You know, so the two main issues that jumped out at me from this episode were, number one, the um, segregation type of rules, you know, the sign, Romulans only. You know, that certainly, as you said, harkens back to the Jim Crow era in the civil rights movement. And, you know, can you do this? Um, you know, more on that in a moment. <clears throat> the second would be, just the, um, it, it, you know, this is where sort of just law intersects with history, um, Star Trek history, the refugee dilemma here. You know, th this is um, the it, really an unprecedented refugee crisis brought about by a supernova affecting not only the Romulan homeworld, but its surrounding worlds, resulting in, I think the estimates I had seen had been what was it 60 million lives um, had to be re, um, you know, relocated. So what, uh, you know, who speaks for the refugees? What rights do they have? Or are they really just subject to the mercy of people who may or may not be willing to help them? I watched the episode with uh, my, uh, my oldest uh, who had questions and I walked them through some of the refugee issues. And as you mentioned earlier, Josh, and this is sort of the an underlying theme, I think, of good science fiction, is that at its best, science fiction is a commentary not on just some fanciful world, but rather on ourselves. It, you know, one only need look at the current headlines to see refugee crises, you know, pre presented right now in the here and now, <clears throat> certainly in the Middle East, um, with the wars going on there, and then countries are in the Middle East and in Europe kind of being pushed to their max, as they say, in terms of accepting refugees and where do we, where do we relocate these people during this time of crisis and what happens to them afterwards? You know, you know I, I think that it's safe to say, and you know, we, we can dive further into this, but the refugee situations um, in history, in Earth history, have seldom you know, had an easy answer, um, have been very complicated issues. And you know, we continue to see the effects of decisions that were made hundreds of years ago, even today. Yeah, there is a lot to unpack with the refugee issue. So we, you know, we see in the past, this refugee hub you know, looking clean, progressive, integrated, yes, forward-looking, very hopeful. You know, Picard doesn't go back after the uh, synth uprising, and when he comes back, everything's gone to hell. I know it, it's slummish, and they won't even receive him. You know, yeah. Well, yeah. understandably, they're they're ticked <clears throat> because the promises that were made fell apart and, right. and the, the Romulan center who senator who be at issue in a moment, you know, says that the the Romulans basically gave up their their uh they didn't execute any of their own plans. So there was like no self reliance because of relying on the Federation and that had a disastrous impact upon them. So yes. uh, again, a lot to unpack there. Um but that does raise the issue of uh, the senator, and let's let's take that where we get into defense of others. That uh, this isn't like a you know a sit-in where you know a drink's poured over Picard's head, which would be bad. Yes. Uh, but this is let's have a fight <clears throat> to death, you know, Mister Ninety-two-year-old man, and here's your sword, and I want to run you through. And it, it's interesting seeing the the Romulans being a sword-wielding uh, culture now. We saw hints of that in Star Trek 2009, but we really hadn't before. We've seen more of the um, 
um, uh, weapon, handheld weapons being a Klingon thing with bathlets and their knives. Right. So, the, so the fact that the Romulans are now now breaking out swords is interesting. And <clears throat> we uh, we seen it with the Vulcans as well. You know, in the original mm -hmm. series, Spock. You know, when he was um, yeah, Amok under time. Ponfar, yeah, a mock time Ponfar. He he was using the on rune, I think it was, mm. and the Lerpa were the weapons. Um, and there's, those have also been mentioned in various novelizations. Given that Romulans and Vulcans are you know, sort of cousin races, if you will, offshoots, I had always figured that the Romulans would have Romulans would have um, similar weapons to the Vulcans, or at least some form of handheld weapons, um, melee weapons, you know, rather than beam or distance weapons. So uh, it is interesting. Yeah, we're seeing them as a swashbuckling culture apparently now. Yeah, which will be more more of that in a, in a moment. But uh, we, we we do have you know this duel, and Picard throws down the sword and you know and says no, and and I do appreciate you know that because he tries talking his way out uh, and apologizing for I screwed up, uh, you know, and and there's a line earlier about I let perfect be the enemy of good, uh, because how many people could he have saved if he had played ball? You right. know, as opposed to you know millions if not billions dying so a lot there yeah so and also is that planet still in existence because of spock sacrifice so something to think about right but we have we have elnor doing his you know full-on elf impression with the sword uh in the issue of defense of others and Defense of others, uh, I, I pulled up both California and New York law, but California says any necessary force may be used to protect from wrongful injury the person or property of oneself or a wife, husband, child, parent, or other relative, or member of one's family, or a ward, servant, master, or a guest, and you don't need a family re relationship, and, and that law goes back to the 19th century. Uh, New York's version is a person may use physical force upon another person when and to the extent he or she reasonably believes such to be necessary to defend himself, herself, or a third person from what he or she reasonably believes to be the use of uh, imminent uh, use of unlawful physical force by such other person. That is a word salad and the word use appearing multiple times in a sentence. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think it's clear that, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is a legitimate defense of others. Uh, care to expound upon that? Yeah, so this is interesting, both definitions, and really they probably have to be um, seen rather than just heard, given that, as you say, they are word salads, as are many you know, legal statutes, uh, just by necessity. Uh, but I want to focus on that word because both of the definitions use the word necessary. So, you know, if I can sort of um, break this down a little bit, what these two statutes say is that a person can use whatever forces, you know, they reasonably believe to be necessary to defend someone else. And then, you know, so there's a couple elements there. But what was interesting for me in watching Elnor in action was that the phrase necessary has often been read by courts to contain some form of proportionality um, requirement. So the effect being that if, um, you know, this, this is defense of self now for a moment, if we can talk about that, if someone is attacking you with say a knife, well then you could reasonably draw a knife and fight them back. If they attack you with a stick, you could reasonably draw a stick to fight them back. Um, but you, one really pushes the limitations of the, the right for self-defense recognized by the law when they exceed that, when they go further than what, is, what would be reasonably considered to be proportionate. So someone comes at you a, at, with a stick and instead you, you know, pull out um, you know, some, a firearm and then just to shoot them down. Like, well, was that reasonable? there's gonna be some disagreement there. <clears throat> That's where I thought Eleanor could be in a little bit of trouble, um, but expanding on the rule a little bit more, you know, we saw examples, famous real world examples of this with uh, Bernie Getz 
and the subway shooting in New York City in the 80s where uh, a number of youths came up to rob him as he claimed and he had a gun and shot several of them um, to the point where he severed one of their spinal cords with a bullet and paralyzed several of them. So he said, hey, I was defending myself. You know, I, I was being robbed or threatened by these youths. Um, but the other side argued, well, you know, these youths weren't carrying firearms. You know, you, you kind of went Rambo on them and that the law doesn't let you do that. <clears throat> and that was a difficult issue. Uh, you know, Getz was ultimately acquitted uh, on, you know, that charge of murder. Um, but he, he, you know, he had to face a couple other charges for possession of the firearm and things like that. Uh, you know, this is a concept with which, you know, we have certainly struggled over time. It, more recently, you know, there was the, the killing in Florida. Um, you know, the, um, it was in the news. I'm going to, I don't remember the exact year now. I want to say between you know, six years, um, perhaps a little longer. But the where the African American youth was killed, um, shot, and the defense used by the person <clears throat> who had done the killing was self defense. Florida had this stand your ground law, and that led him. You know, which was a little bit more than what is recognized in many other states. Um, so, you know, was he, you know, this is the, um, the Trayvon Martin, you know, was the shooter, uh, you know, did he follow the law, even though he arguably, you know, went really far. He, he used dead, he didn't use just physical force to stop the attack. He used deadly force. You know, when, when you look at law enforcement trainings, um, law enforcement folks who are trained with the use of force, one thing we see is that there are you know, many ways to illustrate this, but there are levels of force that they are trained that they can use given the situation. And you can't just jump straight to the end. Typically, you know, you have to respond proportionally. So, um, you know, all of that is just a way of saying, I think, you know, if we apply that here, Eleanor, to his credit, gives the other side a chance to surrender. You know, if I'm defending Eleanor here, if he's being charged with murder, I say, well, look, he said, choose life, walk away. Um, you know, uh, any battle that one enters into with um, the Kuat Milat is going to have a outcome that is not in doubt. And he says that later in the episode. Uh, so at that point, you know, easy to defend Eleanor, but then the three attackers proceed and Eleanor does some fantastic uh, ninja moves, um, Space Legolas, I think, as he's been called by some people. And he takes down two of the attackers, and then the former Romulan center, senator ends up, you know, um, finding himself without a head. Now, is this proportionate? I mean, I, I don't know. I think therein lies the rub. That that's where the battle would be if, if one were defending uh, Elnor. I, I think the argument is for yes is compelling because, you know, again, the 90 year olds, you know, outnumbered by three people, at least three people who want him dead. You know, that's the entire intent is to kill grandpa. And, uh, you know, it was reasonable to say like, yeah, they want him dead. That, uh, that's why they gave him a sword because that way it looks like it's a fair fight. Absolutely. And, and, and while Picard wasn't going to play that game, uh, you know, the, I, I do think it was proportional. Sure, it's extreme because it's not just <laughs> running somebody through. It's like, it's the full decapitation strike, literally. And uh, that's one way to send a message of like, whoa, we're done. Sorry. Yeah. Our, our bad. We're, we're going home now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I learned a lot about myself today and I'm sorry for my participation in this unpleasant. Yeah. You know, if, you know, if I were defending Eleanor, absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head, Josh. My, you know, really quick argument defense would be, look, unarmed 92 year old man uh, with whom I have a relationship is under threat of deadly force. These Romulans are not out to, you know, not out to uh, just give him a little cut or break a bone. They're out to take this guy down and end his life. 
uh, my client, you know, Eleanor had to act, had a split second act. You know, I'm, I'm sorry he didn't just disarm these people, which is very difficult to do, much more difficult than people think. He had to go for center mass and, <laughs> and he had to put these people down and so he did it. And, would, and he would do it again, you know, because he was under oath to this gentleman too. That would be the argument in defense of Eleanor. Now, you know, if we wanted to speak for the three poor dead Romulans, <laughs> we would say, these people were betrayed by the Federation. You know, they, they were, it was a moment of uh, intense passion. They saw this person who had made all these promises who they thought they would never see again, suddenly um, appear again, and they left him alone. And it wasn't until he, he, you know, started the um, confrontation by walking into where he wasn't wel welcome and he stoked the flames. So really it was his fault. Our people were responding to him. And what do you expect? Our people lost everything. This guy was supposed to save them. He abandoned them, broke his promise. And here he is almost spitting in their faces saying, well, you can't run this establishment the way you want. You need to run it the way I want. So of course yeah. our people are going to be angry. Yeah. So that gets it down to manslaughter instead of murder one. So like, it's still <laughs> not really a, a good defense of. It's not going to get them know, off. Yeah. They're not going to be like, walking. Your honor, the civil rights workers infuriated our clients, which is why they mm -hmm. decided to murder those individuals. Yeah. See how that defense works. Right. I just, and, yeah. I'm, so we, and, we weren't going to kill him we were just gonna you know, give him a haircut maybe i don't know you know just scare him yeah yeah okay. um <laughs> yeah this this is not a jury in alabama in the 50s like no <laughs> so <clears throat> cute not happening this is why we have federal law so now a quick issue with contracts you know we we have uh you know the this debt of um you know elnor is you know bound himself to Picard, so it raises an interesting contracts question of of a warrior who has bound himself to a lost cause. And I'm thinking like you know like that's really hard to enforce <laughs> from, a, from a specific performance breach of contract. You know because the fact that it's a lost cause is in yeah. itself a hard thing to make enforceable. Right and. And uh, there's definitely some public policy issues with this, like, I'm going to go behead somebody for a dude. Um, you know, now, granted, going out to defend Grandpa, I don't have a problem with. And <coughs> going on an adventure, we're going to go save somebody. Okay. <laughs> right. We're, we're on board. Let's <laughs> rescue mission. Okay. We're, I'm game. Uh, but the idea of... Um, yeah, it, it, I I don't see this getting enforced in the court. I just it's way too hard. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating. I'm trying to think of a real life parallel, and I don't know if we have one that would match in the same way. Yeah, yeah, I didn't flip through Murray on contracts beforehand or Farnsworth, but I'm pretty sure there isn't. Uh, yeah, unless there's something from Greek. <clears throat> And, you know, antiquity that might be relevant, but I, I just, I don't see that ending well. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, you know, I mean, interesting points here. Um, the one, you have the, the debt itself or this, you know, this oath essentially that's sworn itself. And then the second, the circumstances under which it is sworn, which is we will only bind ourselves to a cause that is essentially judged hopeless, you know, that it's going to fail. So I guess these are hopeless romantics, you know, they love a lost cause and they're going to help the underdog. And yeah. Bravo for them. Uh, if we look at other fiction, I think we see some parallels, um, some other examples. Well, we've got certainly in Star Wars, The Life Dead of the Wookiees. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one example. If we go, and this is going into ancient um, Chinese literature, uh, and I, I think this is where we would see the parallels would be certainly in religion. Um, but one of the most famous Chinese novels, the story of the monkey king, um, <clears throat> Sun Wukong, and he, he, this was one of the most famous stories in Chinese culture, which involves a journey to the West. And it's often called, translated into what's called Journey of the West, where one pilgrim, one priest traveled far to the West for the sacred scriptures to bring them back to China, uh, or back to the Jade Emperor, rather. <clears throat> and it was a very long, dangerous journey. And he went initially on his own with a, with a horse. And, and later... Um, 
he recruited or found several disciples along his way. His first one was the most powerful, um, a monkey, the king of the monkeys, who was magical, powerful, um, very uh, short-tempered, very em emotional, difficult to control. And in the very beginning of their journey, when the priest was attacked, as happens many times during the story, the monkey king jumped out and attacked the um, people that were trying to rob the priest and just, you know, mercilessly killed them, which then horrified the priest who said, you can't do that. That's far more than what you should have done. You shouldn't kill, you know, killing is abhorrent. And the monkey king's response essentially was, you're crazy. I mean, we, you know, that's nice that you live in this, in, in this ideal world, but we live in the real world. And had I not intervened, you would be dead. So you should be thanking me and you are ungrateful. Um, the response ultimately, you know, th there was this big conflict between the two and it resolved when the priest was able to get this special headband or, you know, um, sort of hat uh, that the monkey king wore. And the priest was able to recite uh, a magical chant, which would then Force the you know, force the monkey king to endure tremendous headaches, uh, essentially a form of torture, if you will, with, under which you know which he used to control the monkey king. So the monkey king then said, "Okay, you win. We'll do it your way." And, and you know, during the course of the journey, just like many great stories about journeys, you know, they learn a great deal. The characters evolve. The monkey king learns more compassion and more patience along the way. But it is this almost like a hope i don't know if it's a hopeless journey it's just a very daunting journey um but you have these similar issues like people want to do it different ways and then the priest you know says no we do it my way or no way at all and picard has that same conversation with elnor you know oh well, yeah he doesn't want a body count I mean, right you know, they, it, it just maybe if necessary but like that's not his the picard's way it's not the federation's way and you know there's the motto about being true to thyself even if the federation is slightly isolationist and temperamental what that doesn't mean to walk away from one's values that you have espoused it's uh again like you know with our own country the issue of you know enhanced interrogation of a prisoner you know is permissible and many circumstances or very specific circumstances but torture is not like we're the good guys we don't do that you know and and having like the ticking time bomb situation like okay that's the exception but like that's not the starting point and you know it was again thinking of john mccain arguing on the senate floor of we're the good guys we don't do that sort of thing and and after 9-11 it was easy to slide into that because of fear and the loss and you know just this desire to be safe again so having the federation uh perhaps going through something similar with whatever commodore commodore o is up to with romulan collaborators you know there's definitely something there and and, uh, but that's, I don't want to cross into speculation, but, <laughs> I, but I think those are the issues that, that we can look in the mirror over. And, and I think that, you know, that, that point that, you know, the little speech Picard gives Eleanor after they beam up to the ship where he says, you know, we don't do that that way. But as you said, we're the good guys. Had Picard not given that speech, you know, how disturbed would we have been that it's come to this, that he's become this much of a pragmatist that you know he's given up the ideals because he walked out on Starfleet you know based on his ideals uh, and he still believes in it he's really the living embodiment of what is good and true and you know um, in Starfleet or at least uh, <clears throat> the foundations upon which Starfleet was based mm -hmm. and you know Starfleet is not the same anymore you know, they do appear to be more isolationist uh, I mean we'll find out more I think over time here yeah there's also inspirational leadership uh, at play where you lead by example and this is clearly leading by example of you know like we shouldn't go around beheading people you know there's 
right? like there could have been another way out yeah type, type of thing. Know, and, I, and, and like they did beam out just in time before getting shot at, so <laughs> yes right yeah good, good timing as always um you know question for you here josh um what, first time i watched this it really struck me and as a fan you know i, I just felt a visceral reaction when seeing the beginning of the episode where Picard beams down into the settlement, he's welcome with open arms. He's, you know, th he's done a lot to help these people and the people recognize that. And you think, well, this is great. Juxtaposed with 14 years later when he returns and, you know, the cold shoulder, I think would be um, the diplomatic way of putting it that people just don't really care to see him anymore. And then you have the Romulan center sort of outright blaming him and engaging in what we would say would be conspiracy theories that you took advantage of us when we were, that are most vulnerable, we believed in you, but really you were just trying to permanently make us, you know, these second class citizens of the universe. And Picard saying, no, that, that's not true. <clears throat> you know, I felt sort of a, my gosh, you know, how ungrateful are these Romulans? You know, can't they see how much Picard did for them to, to the point where you threw, you know, walked away from his career. So many people gave so much and yet the Romulan and the Romulan government, I mean, where are they? They did not, apparent you know they didn't step up to the plate so they had to rely upon an age-old enemy to help them why is the romulan anger so directed at picard and i mean i understand why you know why that may be but it seems to be misplaced you know why aren't they angry at their own government they're just focusing on picard and i'm thinking picard could just as easily be like hey what are you talking about like i did everything i could but we don't get that visceral angry reaction from him and what, well, what do you think about that well, Picard's still alive. The government might be Adams at that point, so that could be part of it. Uh, you also blame the people who brought you hope, and when the hope doesn't pan out, yeah. that's, who, that's who you're angry at. Yeah. So I, I do think that's the issue of Picard giving big speeches, promising a lot, people crying, people looking you know, and feeling hope, and then it gets shattered. Now, maybe I, I think you factor in, they haven't seen him for 14 years. Like, yeah. so, it, so if he like, had still continued to try to fight for them and you know, organize a nonprofit and <laughs> like, you know, right, the, right. You know, the extra govern, external government you know, re, uh, relief group, that could have been a different situation as opposed to like they didn't see him again and their, their lives went to hell. So... Yeah, you're yeah. right. One, one could argue he did, in fact, abandon them. Yeah, I, and uh, no, granted, it's not like he personally had the resources to go go out there, but... Right. Um, but somebody of his stature probably could have rallied political support and, you know, created that nonprofit group, kind of like the yeah. way, um, like, post, you know... Um, uh, you know, during the Bush 43 administration, you had Papa 41 Bush and Clinton running around raising money, helping people yeah. in disaster areas. Right. And everyone loved that because, again, this guy diving 85 year old and the president just had a heart, you know, ex president just right. had a heart attack, you know, being buddies, helping people like that. People, we like seeing that. So, yeah, maybe, maybe you could have done that. Yeah, so like the retired admiral rallying some troops, or you know, again, Spock was still a lot around at that point. You know, like he he could have used his political influence to you know either have run for office or form that nonprofit type force to bring good and help others, yeah. as opposed to I'm going to go bottle wine. So I mean, I I kind of get it of. Um, of well, why they're, why, who knows? Why maybe angry. he donates half the profits to uh, you know the refugee resettlement effort every year. Who knows, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, the, the juice could be really good. And oh yeah, there you go. Right. <laughs> He's best serving the the universe by making the Chateau Picard uh, wine. But but yeah, I mean, all all um, joking aside, I, I found it very very moving that in the beginning when Picard shows up at the settlement and he tells people, like, oh, I know we need to do this. We need to get you that. You have my word. And he says that outright, you have my word. Um, and this is not a man who breaks his word. He, he is one of those, my word is my bond type of people. You, you know that he's a, a word and a handshake and that's all you need from him. You know, he believes in honor. 
And at the end, following Eleanor's decapitation of the Romulan senator, Picard looks around at everyone who's gathered and he says, I'm sorry, you know, I'm so, so sorry. And I just thought, wow, that was really, like you could just feel his pain because he, he knows he failed these people. He feels that he failed them. But I'm also thinking, well, what more could he have, like it was, he gave so much. Like he doesn't seem to be getting any credit for that. And these are desperate people. So, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to be able to see it that way, I think. Um, Again, when hope is lost, you blame the person who brought hope. I mean, yeah. It's a very emotional reaction to the right. situation. Of, uh, you know, it's like, you know, granted, you know, you don't be a moron, complain about the color of a lifeboat, get in the damn lifeboat. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that, that's right, right. And, but, yeah. you know, there's a little bit of the heavy as the head that wears the crown there. You know, he's... Mm-hmm. He's the one that they all counted on, and you know he knows it, and he certainly feels that he, you know, he failed. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. Looking, we're getting all these flashbacks. You see, you know, two takeaways on this whole resettlement um, effort. One is just the grand scale is remarkable. Um, how many people were involved? What they were trying to do? Uh, just unprecedented. And then second, that in hindsight, it does you know, historically, it's probably judged as a failure, a massive failure. But, I mean, I don't know. It seems that they did relocate the people. Were they to better lives? No, but they are alive, right? So, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's, uh, your options were that or death. So, yeah, uh, it's like, what more did you want? <laughs> so, right. um, but, but let's take on the other issue of swashbuckling Romulans. And that's pirate Romulans. Yes. You know, I, I do love the classic Romulan bird of prey. <laughs> and, and this is like the, maybe the fourth time that we've seen one. Because we, there's Balance of Terror. Yes. The updated version of Enterprise in Incident replaces one of the uh, battle cruisers with at least one Romulan bird of prey. I was going to say the Enterprise incident, but they used Klingon ships initially, yeah. Yeah, then it was the updated version. And then there's an Enterprise episode where we see a Romulan warbird decloak. So, um, I do love that design. So it's it's (laughs) nice to see it. And it's still formidable. It'd be like taking out the USS Olympia, you know, from museum ship status, you know, yeah. out. And you go like, well, it's super old. Yeah, but it can still fire. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. How, how do you like these cannons, you know? Yeah, yeah it's, it'd be like, you know, yeah, the USS Constitution, you know, is a square rigger. You still don't want to get hit by a cannon. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. Old, old and is still dangerous, so... Mm-hmm. Um, especially if it's well maintained, uh, and Lord knows what their uh, reserve fleet was like prior to the supernova. So if they were mm-hmm. able to take things out of mothball in order to right. start saving themselves, but this raises the issue of like, is that warlord a pirate? Well, looking at the Convention of High Seas. Piracy is any illegal acts of violence, detention, or any other act of deportation committed for private ends by the crew or the passengers of a private ship or private aircraft and directed. Uh, I think that qualifies. (laughs) So I absolutely think that qualifies that those are space pirates. Romulan space pirates, and they probably have swords. (laughs) <laughs> maybe even maybe even ruffly shirts. Yeah, and eye patches and the whole nine yards, right? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's uh, again, find it adorable. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, but yeah, I'm pretty sure those were space pirates. It it, it is interesting. Um, I think they could certainly be classified as pirates. Uh, I think some would argue that they're more more like warlords. Because you know, when we get the briefing um, from Captain Rios, you know, we learn that this colony is in an area of space where it, it's really like the Wild West, very lawless. There's not a lot of law enforcement. It's under protection, former protection at least, of, the, of a group called the Fenris Rangers, a group of which claims Seven of Nine as a member. Um, 
and, but we're, you know, we're going to learn more about that. So it seems that in this sector, you, governments have somewhat failed. You know, there's not a lot of order and it seems that warlords are really in control. So there really is, uh, a, there's a sense of lawlessness out there. So, you know, might makes right. It's the frontier, the Wild West. You've got to have your gun, your, your weapons. Um, and, st- you know, don't count on the marshal to come save you because I, I, I didn't see any law enforcement in the colony when Picard was being attacked. It, it's really just, you know, it's the, um, the, the sister nuns, the warrior nuns. The, you know, they, as they said, you know, they try to go out and help people and they protect Terran and Romulans alike, uh, but they seem to be the closest thing to any sort of law enforcement out there. Yeah, so, and, yeah. And, and and just looking up the definition of warlord, and again, this is not in a legal dictionary, but it's a military commander, especially an aggressive regional commander with individual autonomy. And I think it would we need more information to you yeah. know if he qualifies as that because is is it is he private or is he former military or right you know is he part of the what was it the Romulan free states uh, or something. Yeah, but there was also the Romulan rebirth movement, whatever that is. Right. So we've been teased with a couple different groups, awakenings, movements, and we don't have enough information to make um, informed decisions on how to classify them. We may very well see him again, I think, too, because they they took down the one they sell, but I don't think they blew up the ship. You know, they just kind of got away. They, and they can fix that. <laughs> so yep. like they, they can they can weld that baby back on. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, well, with that, uh, I enjoyed it. Um, again, I'm grateful to have this back. Uh, and you know, we'll see what the next episode brings. Parting thought: um, Agnes Gerardi still your favorite character or most um, likable, relatable character? She, she she's still adorable. She hasn't stopped being that. Uh, so, and, and again, the com- comic relief works for me. Um, I, I do enjoy her and Rios a lot. So Sure. Uh, and Rios is interesting because oh, you know, yeah. he's, he's very measured. You know, he's, he's in, not a hand solo. I mean, he's very much a Starfleet officer. Yeah. So, and uh, he might have creative expression with his holograms and the actors getting lots of versatile roles and playing different versions of themselves. Santiago Cabrera, yeah, really impressive, yeah. Kind of like a lot <clears throat> that they did with, you know, Brent Spiner's data and, uh, you know, all the different versions he got to play. So, yes, yeah. Uh, from, from his creator to evil brother to, fun on the holodeck so yes. again and, uh, so he's he's quite versatile i, I think gerardi may yet prove to be a wolf in sheep's clothing though and th- there it, there was a, someone posted a screenshot and it was from one of the previews although apparently later cut from the episode that shows as you had posited uh, uh, commodore o when she visits gerardi uh, there's another shot that shows o um, engaging in mind meld with Gerardi. What does that mean? Is Gerardi a sleeper agent now? Is this Manchurian candidate territory? Where, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and if it was cut, then it's not canon. So, or do we see that in flashback? Don't but know. I, yeah. Don't well, know. again, we can figure out how to defend her if she is suffering from a Vulcan <laughs> mind meld. She may need a good lawyer at some point. Who knows? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, if, if those katras hanging out or a piece of it like uh, Michael Berman had with Sarek. So, yes, um, we shall see. So, well, that everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, if you enjoy us, please leave a review on Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you enjoy podcasts. We also have a Patreon, and there's some additional content there, so check it out. And uh, come see us too, right? uh, We we can say that we will be at WonderCon, 
Right. But we can't say what we're doing yet. Exactly. Yes. But we will be there and we <laughs> will be at San Diego Comic Fest. And uh, let's just say we're going to have a really good time. Very, yes. very, very exciting. <laughs> so with that, everyone stay geeky. Stay geeky, America.